Hello and welcome to episode 52 of Pixel Sift. If I were you, I wouldn't be caught red, dead, missing this one. I'm Gianni and I'm joined... And I'm joined today by John Marston enthusiast, Scott. Hey, hey. And Red Dead Revolution hater, as evidence there, Mitch. I don't mind it. I no, just don't know anything about it's it. It's not what it says here, Mitch. It says that you hate Red, Devil, Red Dead Re- <laughs> It says you hate that yeah. game. At least I could say the word. Mm. And uh, <laughs> the status we don't know is uh, Ken Johnson, who joins us in the studio today. Ken, what's your feelings on Red Dead Re- um Redemption. Wow, he's still Redemption. working on him. You're a fan, hey, Johnny. <laughs> well, he wrote Re- Revolution in here, and that's not the game. That is not the game. No. I haven't actually played Red Dead Redemption. Oh. It's on my list, uh, but no, just... Completely neutral, Ken yes, Johnson of Hoodwink Games, who's that's joining us in the studio today. Uh, Ken, we're going to be talking about your game, Star Lost, a little bit later on in the show. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Uh, And Mitch, what else do we have in store today? Yeah, we'll be taking a look at some of the mysteries developers use to, you know, supplement their games and keep us uh, scratching our heads. We'll also be talking about money laundering in games. Should anything be done about this underworld epidemic? There's no shipping news this week, but so let's jump straight into our first topic. Sad face. Pixel Sift. No, seriously, Pixel Sift. <laughs> no, seriously. Pixel Sift. So we've been covering covering the problems related to video game gambling sites and their real-world consequences, especially in regards to CSGO and their skin lotto schemes. This brings up obvious problems related to children gambling, and it's pretty much been squashed via Steam now. But today's last story, is, uh, first story actually, is taking things in a little bit more sinister underworld direction. It's come to attention that cyber criminals are using online money and credits to launder real-world cash, which brings in all sorts of new problems and issues to the table. This isn't exactly a new thing, but it's you know it's new to us. Um, and like just in like the real world, criminal elements will eventually seize the opportunity to make or steal an easy buck at the expense of someone else. Is this the same as gold farming in World of Warcraft? Is this what this is? Well, so basically what it is is that um, they're using in-game currencies as a way to... When you talk about money laundering, it's taking money that is from a, a legal criminal activity and putting it through a third-party system in order to bring out money that isn't Clean. attached to that thing, which has right. been cleaned. So that's why it's called laundering. Because yeah. you've um, got it like through legal ways in the end. Yeah. So in the end, what they're doing, they've just found... So Trend Micro has just done a big research... And they found that the cyber criminal has been using this uh, in-game currency in sort of poker and online casino style games. Um, and the way that they kind of acquire this currency is they've got all these um, uh, basically, uh, you know, spyware and uh, viruses and stuff that will compromise your computer. And then they steal your cash um, and then use that cash to pay themselves out in these games. And then they've got a stack of money now that isn't touched by criminal activity. Mm. I don't know if you can spend on other assets that help. That's right. It goes yeah. into other things. As soon as it has been sort of gone through this third party, then it, it doesn't have that same traceable um, nature in there. And, and yeah. So there's a bunch of ways that this is happening. Um, you know, there's hackers sort of out there that are compromising the, I guess, susceptibility of online places like this, like the gambling places, and actually stealing money straight from people. Uh, and then there's also other sites, uh, other places that, like, say, are using, um, you know, games like. Uh, Second Life or World of Warcraft to actually, you know, swap, transfer their, you know, uh, online currency for real currency back and forth through multiple accounts. The interesting way they do this in games like World of Warcraft and other MMOs is they have, um, where you where you mentioned gold farmers there. So basically what happens is they set up uh, deals where they sell you X amount of gold. Um, it's usually sort of a shortcut to you putting in the effort, but you go, oh, look, 30 bucks to buy 10,000 gold. I wouldn't have the time to do that, so I might as well just give them 30 bucks to do that. The way they get that gold, though, is usually by stealing other people's accounts and then transferring all the cash out of that uh, out of the gold in-game currency, and they can buy those accounts online as soon as they get compromised. Right. So the so, money cycle kind of, you send people who have already hacked accounts the money to buy an account in World of Warcraft. They then steal all the gold from that account and then sell it back to legitimate consumers. They then have now got $30 from someone that, 
previously had had no connection but, to the but, uh, criminal world at all. That thirty dollars still comes from an illegal transaction, right? Because you're not actually allowed to sell WoW gold, right? It's not, <laughs> well, it's not illegal to sell WoW gold. Okay, it's against the terms of service of playing WoW. So right. if you're found to do that, your account will get banned. But it doesn't matter because they just buy stacks and stacks of accounts, right? And they just shuffle them around. This is why it's a farm, basically. You know, okay. if you have one crop go down, you've still got the rest of the field out there that can keep bringing you money. I in. see. Um, one of the other uh, things that is particularly interesting was there was a study that was done by the Google Consumer Surveys, and they found that over it was polled over 500 gamers, and they found that 52% of respondents said that they don't even use security software on their gaming computers at all, and they also will disable any security software they have if it uh, interrupts their game at all or it becomes annoying. So they found that gamers overall have a pretty poor cybersecurity hygiene. Yeah, I mean, and there was a... I've kind of done that. Like, yeah. I drop my firewall all the time for certain games, <laughs> which is probably not the same thing as, like, you know, neglecting to update antivirus, but, yeah, I've done that almost immediately. Well, that's all they need to do is present as something else, don't they? They don't need to... Like, you could see something and may it pops, maybe it pops up and it says it's Overwatch. Mm-hmm. And you're like, great, Overwatch. I don't want the firewall to be blocked there. I, uh, you know, want it to go through. So, you, yeah. But it might actually be Overwatch. It might be some other, right? you know, it's Trojan a or spyware. Bit of complacency there. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because it really shows the ingenuity of some of these uh, organizations that are able to funnel this money through in, and use these loopholes that currently exist in order to do these things. Obviously, you know, laundering money, it's illegal. Yeah, uh, but like in the laundering world, you know, anything of value can be laundered. And that's it will right. Be. People were doing this a while with Bitcoin, weren't they? Like they were using yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, so there's well. a couple of different yeah. ways that they've been doing it because there's plenty of, you know, online uh, money places marketplaces for lack of <laughs> better words money yeah places. sorry anyway there's one called uh, as well as bitcoins there's web money there's perfect <laughs> money um there was one that was shut down i'm going to say recently use that pretty loosely uh cost this costa rican digital currency place called uh liberty reserve and that was being used quite heavily to launder american monies i think shut it, down like i said one of the things about it is that obviously that with a cyber currency or an online currency like an in-game currency is there isn't anything physical for cops to seize a lot of the time Mm. as well. So it's not like you have to warehouse a bunch of US Mm. dollars somewhere and then every time you've got it sitting there for the longer it's sitting there, it's it's a risk that it is going to be seized by these things. You can just move this money around. And Bitcoin, for example, the the encryption is, uh, well, the transaction is encrypted. You can only see that it has been transacted, that it has gone, that everyone knows what that transaction has happened, but they don't know where it has gone to. You don't know who sent it or who has received it. So it has a you know one of the big criticisms that obviously it does facilitate the use of uh, online and, and criminal activities because yeah. there isn't that accountability of going through a third party like a bank. Um, so you know this is something that obviously people will have to sort of explore. Um, yeah, I mean it's only getting bigger. Um, like over the last few years, I think has been the real kind of problems, and it's only going to emerge more. I think in uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime issued a report in 2013 on cyber criminals methods it was like a conclusion that said as we spend more and more time and money online opportunities for criminals uh, to involve us in their money laundering scams will only continue to grow and this will create an increasingly difficult situation for the various law enforcement agencies that are already being put to the test by the cunning of such criminals and the myriad of untraceable means they have discovered to launder illegally obtained money that's quite a long conclusion. Very, very well said. I thought United it was going to be more succinct. <laughs> yeah. Well, they wanted to cover all the bases. Yeah, right. Sure we totally I mean, got that's through the it. UN, I guess. Yeah. Um, look, it's, I think this is really interesting. And I think um, not a lot of other games often give you the opportunity in which to actually cash out a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're playing something like Overwatch, there isn't a way that you can go and sell your, your yeah. in-game items. But, but That's then, where the killer comes from, I guess. But it, when you have situations like the CSGO gambling that we had before where there was ways to cash out that money, then there's obviously going to be an encouragement for people to to be involved in that sort of system. Like I said, it's as soon as you anything. involve reward money into anything online, then you're going to get people that are going to take advantage of that, that and that people can, it. Yeah, exactly right. Well, look, uh, let's jump into uh, next topic. We're going to chat to Ken, who has been sitting there quietly and patiently. Ken, what do you think of the, uh, the cyber criminals uh, taking advantage of these systems? Do you think it ruins the fun for everyone out there? Is, does it give you a bit of pause when you're thinking about this sort of thing? Um, my only real experience with... Uh Real Money Marketplace has been Diablo 3. And I'm kind of sitting here thinking, was that the reason why they shut that down, that Blizzard actually removed the uh, Real Money Marketplace from Diablo 3? That is a good well, it's question. It's problematic, yeah, yeah, for sure. It opens up all sorts of like troublesome doors for them. It might have just been easy to shut it. 
Yeah, because it's not like they weren't making money. I mean, there was no. things going for 150 US dollars a piece on there. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's definitely expensive. No pun intended. This is one of the things you wonder as well, that if they're taking their cut, are they too sad that, you know, maybe people are putting lots of transactions through, but if you get 30% of every transaction, that's still a very good bottom line to be giving to all your account execs and all of your investors at the end of the year. So yeah, definitely. It, it was also during a time where WoW, where WoW accounts were kind of slipping a little bit, just a little bit. And they thought they might need to reorientate how they made money. And I mm. think that's the reason why they attempt, like they strategize like that, mm -hmm. except it turns out people keep, keep playing, paying for WoW. So <laughs> they did it. It's fine. That's right. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, jump into our next topic right now. Watch episodes, Let's Plays and more at youtube.com forward slash pixelsiftau. We're joined in the studio by Ken Johnson. He's a programmer from Perth's Hoodwink Studios. Uh, Ken, thanks for jumping in today. Yes. Um, now, tell us a little bit about your game that you're currently working on. Okay. I'd like to describe it as a top-down tower defense game. However, my designer insists that I call it a top-down action game. So um, basically, you've got a spacecraft, and uh, you customize it using your own little towers or hardpoint turrets. And uh, you move around the map using your uh, finger, because obviously it's a mobile game. And uh, yeah, so the turrets shoot automatically for you. And um, it's all about positioning and the like, and kind of getting out of the way of bullets and the like, so you don't die. So um, yeah, that's Silas in a nutshell. Is it using the, I, I guess with the difference between a tower defense game and that you've also got like a fixed path in which you normally would send people down. I mean, there are some variations of that particular um, model, but you've got your path is all, all around you at all times yeah, that's and right. you're moving your turrets all around. Yes. I, I also like to call it a bullet uh, hell hybrid as well um, to kind of get away from that fact. Mm. Um, yeah. So essentially all the enemies come from you at all times and your path, I guess, is uh, created by the bullets that are coming at you that you need to get out of the way. So, uh. <laughs> When you play the game, there is kind of a, a, a balance between uh, leaving your base to go and explore and go for further and further for resources and then also you open yourself up to more of a, a risk when you're out there. Yes. Is that a very important consideration when, when designing the game? Is that one of the most important things? Yeah, definitely. Um, we definitely want to have a risk-reward kind of thing. That's why we've got fuel as a resource in there. It's to force the player to come back to the ship. Um, cargo is another resource. Um, you get that before we have to come back as well. Um, so I really I want people to go out and gamble kind of it's basically programs that the further out you go, the more resources you get in one hit. Uh, so, yeah, the further out you go, you get more resources, you come back. But, of course, uh, there's more enemies. Uh, they're going to shoot you on the way. So so what came first when you were designing the game? Was it the, the gameplay and, the, and that design or was it the setting? Did you think, I want to make a science fiction spaceship game? We definitely wanted to make a science fiction game. That was unanimous. Uh, what we did when we first started developing is uh, Chris went off. Uh, he's our designer. He went off and... Uh, he created a, created a um, kind of look and feel for the game, uh, as well as the basic control control structures. And I went through and I did a uh, demo using the asteroids and uh, just the weapon movement, turrets and the like. Chris is your artist, uh, yes. Chris Hitchens, who you're working with. What are some of the challenges of, of working in a small two-person team? Um, I'd say one of our biggest challenges is definitely uh, the disagreements <laughs> that have caused between us. Um, I have, I'm, I'm quite a perfectionist and um, I've certainly rattled a few nerves when I go through and uh, I, I pick some of his work. Um, yeah, but other than that, um, what are the challenges? Would it, do you think it would be handy to have a third person to kind of be a tiebreaker in some of these <laughs> situations? Uh, possibly. Um, I think what we're actually missing from the team would be an artist. Um, definitely that's something that's lacking between us as well as model creators. So um, it's just in terms of time. Um, we just don't generally have enough time to work on the game all the time. Because you were telling me a little bit earlier that you're doing this as you know a, as a side project, as, as yeah. part of full-time work, and that Absolutely. you've also juggling kids and family life and all of that sort and of a stuff. Uni computer science degree. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So busy uh, man. Starless development occurs for me between eight and usually about eleven o'clock at night. Nice. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I guess you've got to have a routine when you're that so busy. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's it's definitely important to try and get as much done and to try and be as efficient as possible. Yeah. Um, for example, once once something works, you leave it and you move on to the next thing. It's it's no real refinement here. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in regards to the mobile aspect of creating a video game, I, I was speaking to the Outback Pixels guys at uh, Perth Games Fest, and um, I asked them, do you need to 
take battery life into consideration when you make your game like or, or even like consumption uh definitely we've had many issues particularly with uh just just the amount of resources we're demanding because um it's not a typical kind of pixel art or uh, 2d style game um we definitely stress the hardware um, we've had issues with memory uh, for example draw calls is where you um send different command structures to the command sets to the graphics card uh, we've had far too many of them we've had to cut back models we've had to remove shadows it's mm. It's been so many times where we've gone, this looks fantastic, and we've got all this transparency everywhere, and then we've had to go on for, no, we can't have that. <coughs> we have to replace models with uh, opaque, kind of do your outlines, view bullets and the like. So it's definitely challenging developing for the mobile. And during that time, have you ever considered maybe, you know, making a non-mobile version with the full kind of a range of assets that you've created? It's definitely on the plan, yep. I think. It's definitely... Um, It'd be something more where we'd go through, go back off, go through our assets again, uh, improve them, uh, definitely add in a lot more effects like lighting. Yeah. That's one thing that's missing. Um, in terms of the mobile, though, it's definitely got a bigger market. Mm. And in terms of our play structure, um, where you're not really interacting a huge amount with the environment, uh, I think it's more suited to mobile at this stage. Absolutely. I'm really keen to play. I'm a huge tower defense <laughs> fan, so I'm really looking forward to sinking my teeth into it. <laughs> It is like the rapid expansion of mobile technology. Is that something that you really have to keep an eye on when you're developing? Um, we've got our own devices. So I've got a Samsung Galaxy S4. We've got a Samsung Galaxy Tab S2 that we develop on. So we try and develop for that. Um, the biggest problem that we think we find is uh, backwards compatibility, particularly with the older phones. Um, we had an issue just recently where uh, we were killing devices, start loading the first level and it would die. Um, <laughs> we no idea, absolutely no idea where that was coming from. So um, we kind of, we, how we solved it is all the people who complained, they gave us our de device hardware. We went and looked up and it was actually the RAM that was on the device. So uh, we had to cut things back and re-release. So it's it lots of cutting the fat off then, hey? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Is that uh, that must be a big consideration then? That especially with Android devices, there are a lot of different types of ver variety of specs and things like that. Definitely. Uh, when do you kind of uh, well, what, what would you do if you're calling a line and somebody's playing on an Android phone that's like you know three or four years old, and they're like, oh, this game doesn't work. Um, what 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 can you do about that sort of thing? I think in that case, we're just going to have to accept the negative review and hopefully get some more positive ones to uh, cover it up. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, it's, um, you know, obviously something that having a, the variety of devices being able to play, um, play your game and, and, and try it out with that is obviously something that would be very handy. You were recently at the Perth Games Fest yes. and you had a lot of different people come in and play your game. What was some of the feedback that people were giving you as, as they were playing it? A lot of them, I guess the idea behind Star Lost is we're treating the entire game screen as a D-pad. Um, a lot of them weren't used to that fact. They were used to the having a little D-pad in the corner and they wanted to be able to move their finger around just in the one spot with, instead of interacting. Um, I, I guess my, my consideration for the game, I want it to be very visceral, kind of, you press on this, it does something, you press on that, you move here. Um, so it, it's one thing now we're having to consider just because we had so many people ask for it. Um, so we've got some things in mind to implement like a virtual kind of moving D-pad. So that's, that's one of the, I guess, the major feedback points that we had at the Perth Games. So it's currently in an alpha. It is available now on uh, Android if yes. you want to come and play the game. Uh, you can go to playstarloss.com if you want to get in on that. Basically, it's probably the best place to go to. How long do you think it'll be before you are releasing it out into the world in its uh, first 1.0? In all its glory. Um, time dependent. I'm thinking possibly February, March next year. Uh, my Chris, my partner, he is saying December. Um, I, I don't think so. No. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, but it's. I don't think it's Is this how he has to find out? <laughs> oh no, he's. he's, he's uh, uh, yeah, I just go blank. Are we that third like, party? Are that... you kidding? <laughs> Chris, hit it's us up on Twitch thing. chat. Uh, tell us what you think about the uh, <laughs> the thing. Um, but yeah, so coming out earlier in the ne in next year and yes, trying to get as many people to play it before between now and. In that time. Yes, hopefully February, but don't quote me on it. <laughs> no worries. Well, look, head to our website because we will have a link to the alpha where you can play uh, Starlust on uh, Google Play on Android devices. Android only. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a fun game. We we're going to play a little bit of it a little bit later on in the show as well. Uh, thanks, Ken. Stick around. We'll nice. have uh, uh, one more topic, but which we'll nice. jump into right now. Pixel Sim. It's not Pixel Siv. It's Pixel Sift. Pixel Sim! Tough.
Man, I really don't like it when you use that intro when I have to talk like right <laughs> after it. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. the best one we've got, Mitch. It is one of the best ones. My favorite one. You're, you're a classic. We're lucky to have you. Yeah. I... <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. All right. So video game culture boasts some of the most passionate fans out there. One reason for this is that creators of games like to reward super dedicated players with extra content that asks them to go the extra mile or, you know, stray off the beaten track. Um... So a couple of these things are in a game I like to play called Destiny. There are a lot of. I haven't like, heard yeah, of it. Can you yeah. tell us a little what? bit about, us that about one? it? Yeah. So <laughs> I think one of my favorite. There are a lot of really big examples of this, like the all the exotic quests and um, the recent one in the all the raids. Pretty much have one of these. But I think the magic of this is some of the hidden stuff that requires players to really work hard and really explore to find them. Um, I think, as I was saying, my my favorite example of this is the Black Spindle quest. It's a exotic sniper rifle which you get by doing a particular mission at a particular time in a particular way and you get the clues for doing this by dismantling the previous version of the weapon and i think that's one of my favorite examples of it in destiny do you think it's a there's a value to having these sort of i guess not overt uh you know quest objectives and and having that sort of thing that lets people explore and uh you know go back to the primary school days where there's rumors in the playground of the best way to to beat the uh you know super mario world 2 or oh, I, man. I appreciate it very much actually it, it it that is like absolutely like just the mystery of it and i think it's a big risk by developers because they make something too challenging they could work very hard on certain assets and gameplay and you know coding and then it may not even be found i mean the internet these like with the internet as it is now it's always found but it's it's definitely an extra mile that i, I appreciate very much Ken, do you remember any from the uh, Super Nintendo days that people used to talk about and ideal ways to get 99 stars in one go? I guess my favourite example would be uh, Super Mario 3, and I believe it's uh, it's World 1, I think it's level 4 or 3, uh, where you grab the turtle shell and you sit on the white block and uh, fall through and then run along and uh, get the warp whistle. Uh, so that's one of my examples. And how did you find out about that? Was that a... Uh, it's been so long ago, honestly. It's over 20 years It's ago, gone so into the mists that's of time what now. That blows my mind about that era of secrecy in games. Like, how did... Like, Who the, worked like it out? Like, the first Zelda. Yeah. I don't even remember how I figured out how to... Do you know what? I, th- I think my mum helps me out on that, to be honest. <laughs> like, because, you know, I just didn't have the faculties to be able to deal with a game like that. I was, a, you know, knee-high to a grasshopper. Um, it just baffles me how, yeah, stuff like that was figured out pre-internet and how it spread as well. Yeah, like, One of the yeah. best examples, when we've talked about it in previous episodes before as well, is the um, Binding of Isaac when they had mm. a big uh, sort of uh, secret quest and secret um, game that was in, in that when they were releasing the, you know, the remastered version and the release of new characters where they basically tasked people to be on this sort of giant treasure hunt to find little bits and pieces and there was all these rumors about like okay so if you blast through this uh, level and you make it through the room in you know less than one second by using this particular set of gear and then you can do this and then it unlocks this and blah 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 i think that has a really strong uh you know strong value for people who are sort of sharing in the experience of your game and the community of your game but that's it it makes the game so much more than the game itself it becomes this community kind of meta game um and i've got a really good because uh, we 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 did cover the binding of isaac uh, you know many shows ago uh when we covered this kind of um episode 9 if you wanted like there to you go, go back Gl- and listen to it i think yeah. it was more glitchy secrets and whatever anyway yeah. um there's a really amazing uh mystery around trials revolution which is like a, um, what, what do we call it's it? A, two, two and a half D type. Um, Side scrolling motorbike. So if anyone runs like Elastomania, it's that kind of thing, but very new age, I guess. Anyway, um, so in that, there was this point uh, where you could um, pause and listen to a song. And in the song, if you like, well, it, there was lyrics that alluded to you having to see it in a different light, which meant that you had to actually spectrally analyze the music that was being played. And in that was a Morse code. And in that, it led to the, all these real world locations in from like San Francisco to Sydney to UK to 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 South Helsinki, and there was these things buried in places. And long, long story goes on that this is still ongoing, and it won't be solved until like twenty one thirteen, I believe. And like everyone that twenty one thirteen, yeah, sorry, yeah, we will all be dead long before it gets sorted out. So, so basically, you'll be dead. They recovered four yeah, keys. Yeah, I'll be a robot by then. <laughs> they recovered one, uh, four keys uh, off from these places, and one of them will unlock something at the base of the Eiffel Tower, tower at, in the year 2113. Uh, How are they going to set that up? 
Do you think the city of Paris the is guy? like, no? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. The guy is has plans, I guess, you know, to make it pop off. It's going to be in his will or something like that. It's just, you know, you must bring this box to this thing I mean, on as, that date. As uh, elaborate as some of those <clears throat> things are. So elaborate. That one yeah. just blew my mind and it took me like an hour to find, like to even just read about it. I mean, there are some that are very simple, like, for example, the ghost in GTA. Like, I visited that today, actually. Or even I... the UFOs. A lot yeah. of the mysteries in GTA, actually, are on the surface level, are really easily achievable. Mm -hmm. But then there's more to it, I guess. Yeah. But, I think yeah, the, I GTA, ghost one, the GTA example, uh, you know, while the game online may be filled with animals, that the single-player game actually had... Uh, had a really strong community, mm, and I remember mm -hmm. watching people deciphering all the clues and the the mysteries inside that to find all the different UFOs in that game and seeing if there was a you know a pilotable UFO because someone had done yeah. some data mining yeah. and they're like you know that was something that I think most game developers would you know kill for mm -hmm. to have such a strong. Uh, community behind it. Obviously, GTA is a hugely high-profile game, millions and millions of dollars mm. worth of budget. Um, but you know that sort of uh, hype and 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 talking around your game is something that is something that. And there's a lot of other great examples that kind of followed that um, with uh, Polytron Corporation's Fez in 2012. They the searching for the meaning of the monolith. I guess that went on for a long time, uh, and it was figured out, but it was done in a kind of semi-hacky sort of way semi kind of brute force type of way so like the actual meaning of the uh, you know the, the proper solution and answers was never really discovered like or maybe there were we don't know um but yeah that was uh, there was supposed to be a fez 2 as well but that was canned for all sorts of personal reasons I think. yeah um there's got some other good examples though legend of kane blood omen uh there was a secret area where there was like a whole other extra bit to the story that sh which was you know this whole ship and shore etc uh and the other one that really um interests me was uh shadow of colossus there's like lots of people endlessly searching for uh content and colossi i guess yeah they said that was supposed to be a secret colossus that was going to be in the game and you had to nobody do found these... anything but, How uh, but some of these but times in in the in doing that they also figured out all these other things that you could do in the game to really push your ability to search um yeah. like aggro launching which is like basically getting the horse to launch you up to yeah. different places where you could be otherwise inaccessible yeah i was talking to my friend aaron today just about this topic and mm. he told me uh payday has a secret vault in one of the levels really so, and one of his friends was actually pretty instrumental in finding that mm. yeah so, oh, that's a dream to be like yeah. to be on the cusp of one of these mysteries is like because cool. I, I remember when GTA came out I was like oh man chili things and then I just you know cut to work or whatever and came <laughs> home and it was a way ahead of where I was at. my um, my feeling when a lot of these things come out and I see these like secret mysteries and ARGs and Easter eggs that people are working their way through is like I am not smart enough and I do not have enough time so I'll yeah. just wait until it gets solved Look, and I will enjoy the fruits yeah. of your labor I would recommend Absolutely. if anyone hasn't ever looked into the trials revolution um, mystery that it is it's it's amazing and really impressive on that level that I'm just like I, it it just baffles me how anybody could conceive of the things and together as a as like on your online community it's just fantastic. Um, the there is actually a class of game designer who people who are actually specialize in building these sort of secret mysteries and ARGs and all that sort of thing. So you know if this is something that you get a kick out of and you enjoy solving, then you know think about it. You may be able to turn that into a job and work well, this into other everyone likes games. to feel smart, and you always feel smart when you figure out something that you, you know gen like genuinely gen gener gen uh, generally weren't supposed to figure out. Fifteen forty two thirty five. There you go. I started ours. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Look into it. I mean a lot more later. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'm obviously yeah. not smart enough to work that 20, one out. 2054. I'll tell you what I have. Coming up next. I'll tell you what we have worked out, though, that it, this is the end of the episode. We've reached the conclusion of episode 52. Ken, thanks for joining us. Um, you can head to playstarlost.com. Yes, that's right. Um, to play your game, Starlost. Um, you're from Hoodwink Studios. Flash Hoodwink Games on Twitter. If you want to look them up on there, give them a follow. Um, we have got a website where you can go and find links, for example, to Ken's game. Um, that website is pixelsift.com.au. Uh, we also have social media uh, where you can follow us. You can find us on... Facebook.com forward slash pixelsift, Twitter.com forward slash pixelsift, twitch.tv forward slash pixelsift, and youtube.com forward slash pixelsiftau. And Mitch, uh, we're on very many different podcasting and video platforms, aren't we? If you have a favorite one, we're on it. Let's just face it. Um, except Google Play. 
You can't get it in Australia yet. No, we're yeah. on that. We're on that. Yeah, but we're that. just we're on that. But you can't get it in we've Australia. Been through this, Mitch. They just don't yeah. let anyone come into this into that into their house on that sort of thing. They'll so. be receiving an email from me. me. We're also this week <laughs> as well um, have got every single video that we've uploaded or created um, up on Twitch as well. So Twitch now has a system where you can watch uh, videos that have been created in the past. You've uploaded them. So all of our episodes that have been recorded are on there for you to watch. If YouTube is not your thing. But Decent. if YouTube is your thing, you can go there too. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ken. Uh, we'll see you guys again very soon. Peace out.